He's not someone who lived, he lives. He was, he is, and he is to come. Can you praise the Lord? He's in the world today. He's in my heart today. I don't serve some philosophy that Jesus taught. I serve Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we need to get connected to our Savior afresh and anew every day. Amen? In the day that we live in where there's so much evil, there's so much hatred, we need to connect with the Savior. We need to connect with the Savior. My message this morning is entitled, Abide in Me. And I can't take credit for that because it's in the Bible. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's by the fruit that... The world knows that we are his disciples. Amen? It's very interesting, this wonderful passage of Scripture, very familiar to us. We probably have read it over and over again in our life. But let's not pass by it today and just say, wasn't that a good word? Let's do what it says. Not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. This is a very important admonishment from Christ our Savior. These are red letters. I like reading the red letters once in a while, you know, because those are the words of Christ himself. And it's not only interesting that these are Christ's words, but it's interesting when he said these words. You'll notice by the timeline that John has laid out for us in this book and these words, these words are spoken between the Last Supper and Gethsemane. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. There was an eight-mile trip from the upper room where the disciples and Jesus shared the Last Supper and Gethsemane. And as he's walking along, he's teaching, he's giving parables, he's praying for his disciples, he's praying for us. All in that time span, hours from the moment that he's going to give his life for the world. And what are his last words? This is so important to us. His last words to his disciples, abide in me, stay in me, and I will remain in you. How important that is, not only for what it says, but for the timing that it is. I'm about to leave. I'm about to leave this world. But what? I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send someone who you will be able to connect with spiritually. See, the disciples didn't understand at this point. They still were clueless about what Jesus was all about. They still, in their mind, thought that Jesus was going to make an earthly kingdom, that Jesus was here to overthrow the government and to establish his kingdom on earth. And Jesus always said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is accessed, not physically, but spiritually. And so Jesus is telling them one last time, you have to remain in me. But they weren't getting it. They didn't understand what was going on. They, like us today, want to overthrow the government and establish God's kingdom in this world. It's not going to happen. Jesus never said it would happen. My kingdom is not of this world. So how do we connect with that kingdom? We connect with that kingdom on a spiritual level, connecting with Christ himself, amen? And so what did he say? Well, how do you do this? How do you abide in a Savior who has received a glorified body? He's in heaven as the only one with a glorified body, and we're down here, we're we're here. He's at the right hand of the Father, but he sent his spirit. I'm going to send you another comforter. 
When the Spirit of God comes upon you, he will guide you into all truth. He will empower you to be my witnesses. He will give you the life that you need. But that's my spirit. That's the spirit of Christ. Amen? And so he asks us to remain in him. What does that mean? My heart is fixed. I'm fixed on Christ. Every part of my day as a believer, as a child of Christ, as a child of God, saved by Jesus Christ, has to be in a connection with the vine, right? Apart from him, I can do nothing. You know how many of us walk around as branches apart from the vine all week long and wonder why nothing's happening? Apart from me, you can do nothing. You have to abide in him. You have to know him so intimately in every word that he says, in every uh, impression of the spirit, right? We sing, this is my daily bread, my daily bread. We sing it so beautifully, but it's true. This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me. How can we live without the word of God? How can we live without the word of Christ speaking to us daily? We can't. We can do nothing. This is the air I breathe, your very presence, your very presence. You know, it's, a, it's about knowing him in a way that some of us just don't know him. Some of us represent a Christ that we've formulated in our own mind and our own thinking, but it has nothing to do with what the word of God says. I have been married for almost 24 years now. Seems like just a couple months. It's been so wonderful. It's just not... It's, flies by. <laughs> but over those years, you know, you that are uh, in great marriages, um, you know you begin to uh, be able to not uh, communicate non-verbally, right? You can, you can see in a facial expressions. You can see in, a, in a, any kind of expression what your spouse is thinking. I know when she's mad at me. I know. She doesn't even have to say she's mad at me. Her lip goes up like this. Yeah. And her nostrils flare at me. I'm telling you, I've, I've, it, it brings shudders. Shudders. She's done it. I've been at the piano before. I'm telling. I've been at the piano before. You're all my witnesses. And she'll be up here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. She'll turn around. What are you doing back here? Praise God. What I'm doing is making a lot of mistakes. That's why she's yelling at me. But there's those, those things I can see in her. I can see when she's happy. I can see when she's tired. I can see when she's contemplating. I, I know just by... I, sometimes you can just walk into the room with your spouse and you can see them all the way across the room and you can know what they're thinking. This is the kind of relationship that Christ is calling us to with him. How much more important it is for us to abide in Christ so that the very simplest of gestures, the very sim simplest of expressions, that still small voice we respond to immediately. I'm, a, I'm afraid too many Christians in the world today have nothing, no, no kind of relationship like that. They don't even know what to do next because they're not abiding. They're not investing. They're not connecting with Christ in the way that he's asking us to. Listen, we're called to be separate. We're not of this world. Neither is the kingdom of God of this world. But yet we try to do things like the world does things. We conform to the pattern of the world. And Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's renewing your mind? What's renewing your mind? Listen, I'm preaching to myself today. This, this message has been beating me up for two weeks, okay? Ever since I knew I was going to be preaching. What's renewing your mind? You know what? Satan puts things in our lives that are shiny and flashy and have uh, about six-inch screens, and you can swipe, right? And those are distractions from the word of God, from us connecting with Christ. It's so much easier for me to get up in the morning and say, wonder what's happening on the news. Let me see what, before I hit the word of God. What do people say about me on Facebook? Do they like me? Do they really like me? <laughs> I don't, by the way, if you get on my Facebook, I don't like likes, I like comments. Don't just like me, take the time to say you love me. 
<laughs> but isn't that something that is within our, our sinful nature, our selfish nature, that goes to those things first? How many of you go to Facebook before you go to God for prayer requests? I see it all the time, and I've been guilty of it myself. I'm not going to pray to Facebook. I'm going to pray to my Savior. I'm going to connect with my Savior. He's got all the answers. Facebook has no answers. They have only questions. But the Word of God and my spirit, the Spirit of God has all the answers. Amen? So he wants us to be fixed on him. He wants us to live and move and have our being in him. Some of you are old enough to remember things that were prior to flat screen TVs. You know, we didn't, we weren't able to hold our TV in our hand. When I was growing up, it was a TV set. And it was not just a TV set, it was a piece of furniture. <laughs> Am I right? Y'all are old. The ones that were singing with me a minute ago, y'all know. And so there was this TV set, and you were lucky if you had, and, and do you know the thing about snow? You know snow? You don't know snow from TV because we don't have that anymore. But we had a lot of snow on TV. It was a horrible picture. We were lucky to get three or four networks. And uh, there was no cable. There was nothing. There, was no, there were no dishes. There was no satellite dish. Nothing. You know what there was? An antenna. <laughs> they were rabbit ears. You millennials, it's not the bunny. It's not on the bunny. It was, they were called rabbit ears. And they brought in the signal. It was like a radio. The, air, the, the signal went through the air, and it went to the antenna. And, and a lot of times, I'd have to hold the antenna in one hand, <laughs> hold my foot out, try to get that perfect fit. Anybody, anybody remember? <laughs> and so, and guess what? My dad told me I was the remote control. There were no, there were no buttons to push from a distance. There was no remote control. I said, David, go change the channel. And I'd go over and I'd go, chunk, 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 chunk. Right? Sometimes with the pliers. Chunk, chunk. <laughs> you remember? You remember. No. <laughs> but around that chunk, chunk, chunk was another dial. It was the one that just slid real slowly until you got that clear picture. That was called the fine tune, right? And you fine tuned into that. Isn't that how we need to be with God? We need to be with the Spirit of God. We need to be with the Spirit of Christ. That fine tuning, always looking for that perfect image to come in and to communicate with Him. That's what abiding is. That's what knowing him is. That's what he's calling us to do. Too many Christians today will identify with a church, will identify with an organization. We're in a country club called a church. But that's not what Christ asked his disciples. His disciples abide in me and I in you. And guess what? You're going to bear fruit if you stay in me. Look at that. How do we do that? We stay in God's word where our heart is and fixed on him. We obey his commands, remaining in his love. Look what he says in John 15, 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. We have to love. That's one of the fruits, isn't it? Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. So there's two types of branches. In 15, verse 3, it says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You remain in me, and I remain in you. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Oh, Lord. I don't want to be that branch that doesn't bear any fruit. Do you? I see it, though, all the time. I see people coming into the, to the church weekly, and they have no fruit. All they have is a withered branch. And they come, and they say, I don't know why. My life. Can you pray for me, Pastor? My life is all withered. My life is all withered. Well, I, I can pray for you all day, but until you connect to the vine, you're walking around with a withered vine. How many weeks, how many months, how many years are you going to keep coming in here with that withered vine and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray that it'll live on its own. Pray that it'll live apart from the vine. 
Pray that this branch will live on even though I don't connect to the vine. It's not going to happen. Eventually, it's gonna, you're going to lose. You're going to be cut off, thrown into the fire. The only answer, not Pastor Boykin's prayers, not my prayers, not the prayers of your brothers and sisters, the only answer is connecting with Christ. Abiding in Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior, and then staying with him, walking with him, talking with him along life's narrow way. He directs your paths. So there's another type of branch, though. There's a branch that bears fruit. And guess what happens to that one? Pruning. Pruning. Why? Because the gardener, who is the father wants that branch to bear as much fruit as it possibly can, and he knows exactly how to do it. I have a little green thumb. I had a better green thumb in Michigan. I came down here and I planted my tomatoes that I had in Michigan, and they got this little white fly on them. That's nothing but the devil. Took my tomatoes. So I haven't been very successful here. I'm gonna try again, but I learned that what you do with the tomato plant, if you want it to bear fruit, is you got to take care of the pruning process all along the way. If you want it to do well, if you want to have a good harvest, you have to prune. And it starts from the very beginning. When I bring that little plant home from the nursery or Home Depot or wherever I'm getting it from, I cut off every branch below the top two. There could be 40 branches on there and people go, oh, look at it, I got a nice big plant. No you got to cut all those branches and sink that thing into the dirt where only the top two leaves are sticking out. Why? Because a good gardener knows that every branch you cut off turns into a root under the ground. It'll begin to form a root structure to help support that plant. Guess what? That's not very enjoyable for that plant. That plant turned from a delightful, big, beautiful plant into a nothing, just a little. But the gardener knows what to do. And so what happens then? The thing begins to grow up, and all of a sudden, you get these little yellow flower buds. And guess what those are? Baby tomatoes, right? And I love that part, right? But some of the branches don't have those little yellow flowers. Guess what they are? Suckers. That's what they call them. They suck the life out of the plant because all they're there to do is look pretty. They're not going to bear fruit. So what does the good gardener do? Cuts them off. Cuts them off. What is the gardener doing in your life? You're bearing fruit, and all of a sudden, uh, you feel a knife, a sharp pruning. You feel a prod. Jesus said to Paul, why do you push against the goats? I'm warning you. I'm pushing you in the direction you're going to need to go. And you keep, stop. I'm nice and comfortable like this. And what's he doing? He's trying to guide your branch in the right direction. He's trying to prune. But we look at it as the enemy. Oh, the enemy is attacking me. He's trying to cut things up. Listen, if you're a child of God, if you're connected to that vine, and you're that branch that's bearing fruit, everything in your life is ordained by God. Even the attack. Ask Job. Go ahead and ask Job. What was he doing wrong? Nothing. He was doing everything right. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Was that Satan? Yes, but it would not have happened were it not for God saying, let it happen. And so what? What's it designed for? It's designed for our good. It's designed so that we will bear much fruit and be the best fruit bearers that we can possibly be. But if we keep pushing against that pruning, guess what? Eventually we're going to stop bearing that fruit. Because all of a sudden, there's going to be all these things in our lives that are the suckers. They're going to suck the life away from the fruit. And the Lord knows what those are. 
And he says, look, I want to prune you. I want to make you as productive as possible. Even Jesus, the Bible says that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the desert. Capital S. Look it up. Because God want, had him go through that temptation process for a purpose. Everything about our lives is a purpose. We can go 10, 15 years and keep pushing against it, pushing against it. That's the devil. That's the devil. That's the devil. Well, if I'm a child of God, I better figure out what God is letting the devil do to me so I can move forward. Right? And be mature and complete. That's important. That's important. But we as Christians in America, especially with our American theology, we want everything to be comfortable and blessed, and we want our cars and our airplanes and our, we want trips around the world, and we want a beautiful mansion, and, and if we don't get it, God doesn't love us. That's our theology. That's our American theology. When we're pruned, God loves us. When we go through trials, God loves us. When we're blessed, it's because we've gone through to get to the blessing. Amen? And if we would start approaching life this way, we would have a lot less trouble. If we would just start letting the Spirit of God guide us and prune us and move us in the right direction and recognize that this is for our good so that we'll bear fruit that is lasting, things are going to go a lot better for us. But we have to get rid of this mentality that everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be comfortable for me. No, it's through resistance that you grow stronger. Amen? All right, so don't, don't uh, push against the pruning process. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it, Hebrews 7, 11. All right, I got to get back on track here. Okay, so what is the fruit? What is the fruit that we're trying to get to? What did Jesus say in uh, John 15? Back to John 15. He said, verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my... Anybody with me? Love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his... I have told you this so that your joy may be complete and you in you and that your joy may be complete. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm misreading this. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. When Jesus is talking about the fruit that's going to happen, it's saying love, 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 love. Paul later adds the fruit of the spirit, doesn't he? But the greatest of these is love. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It also says in the word that if you say you love God, yet you hate your brother, you are a liar. You are a liar. Bible says, love your enemies. Oh, it's so much easier to love my friends. But when you're connected to the vine, the spirit of love is flowing through your branch and out and giving you the supernatural ability to love your enemies, to love that ex-husband, that ex-wife, that abuser, that person that robbed you, that politician that criticized your homeland. If you say you love God, yet hate, you're a liar. What sets us apart from the world? What sets us apart from the pattern of the world? A renewing of our mind through the word of God and through the spirit of God that gives us the ability to love people that hate us. Because guess what? Christ died for you and loved you when you hated and despised him. And what did he say? Father, forgive them on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
That's who God is. God is love. And those that are servants of God have to be love as well. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is being connected to that vine. The only way is being empowered by the Spirit. I can't love my enemies. I feel like they should be crawling on glass to my door. You know what you're right? It's right. Your flesh doesn't want to have anything to do with loving your enemies. And yet some of the things I see posted on Facebook by people that love God, stuff that is said even in the church by people that love God, stuff that is said about different people by people that love God, examine yourself. Examine the fruit. There's no fruit called hate. There's no fruit called anger. There's no fruit called despising. It's love. Jesus said, love, 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 love. And guess what? When you have the spiritual love that Christ is calling us to do, he says, then my joy is in you. And your joy is complete. When I'm loving the way God empowers me to love, it's joyful for me. I'm not resenting it at all. I'm for, I'm, I have that joy, which is another fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Guess what? That fruit is for others. The gifts are for us. But the gifts are designed to help us bear fruit for others. I don't need the fruit of the Spirit to love God. I, love, I need the fruit of the Spirit to love you. Sorry, I didn't mean to point at Magda. <laughs> so what happens? I, we had a beautiful apple orchards in Michigan, and we would go every year. It was one of my favorite things to do. It was the last thing you could do before 11 months of winter. But <laughs> go to the pumpkin patch and go to the apple orchards, and it was great. You get on the back of this uh, hay, hay ride, I guess, or a cart. I don't know much things about farming. <laughs> so we go, and... There were some years where you just couldn't believe how many apples were on these trees. I mean, they were so loaded down. They were just clumped on there. And guess what? There was all on the ground, too. I said, oh, no, look at all those that are on the ground. You know what the farmer said? The farmer said, don't worry about that. What that does is that nourishes the roots for next year. Right? A good gardener, a good, listen, you're... Fruit isn't necessarily only for others, but those that drop, those that fall at the root, they will bring nourishment to yourself and will grow. And guess what? Then you're going to be just heavier and heavier, weighted down with fruit because the farmer, the gardener knew how to get you to that point. Amen? Don't you want to be there with me? Don't you want to be there? I'm just so tired of people running around calling themselves Christians that don't have any fruit to offer anybody. They're just in name only. It's just country clubs. Listen, we don't look at the fact that we have all these giant growing churches in America and around the world that are super packed and have 47 campuses and they're online or whatever. And, oh, wow, they're successful. By your fruit is how I know you're my disciples. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care if you're on national television. Not criticize. I, I can't judge anything but fruit, right? And when I see the fruit, I know that they are disciples of God. Amen? So don't you want that? Don't you want God to be able to accomplish in your life that which is necessary to bear fruit? Here's the benefits that Jesus lays out. Benefits of remaining in Christ and bearing fruit. It's to God's glory. John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Listen, we can say glory to God all day. We can sing glory to God all day. We can, we can shout and all that. But what brings glory to God? Fruit. You bear fruit, that brings glory. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Are you chintzy with the good deeds and the fruit to the neighbors? In Michigan, right now it's snowing, and it's going to be snowing for a long time. But 
I can remember when it snows, it's time to shovel your sidewalk, right, in front of your house. And most neighbors, they get out that measuring tape. It's like, okay, here's the lot line. I'm going to shovel right up, right up to that line, and then they're on there. You know, the Lord convicted me one night about 11 o'clock. It's 20 below zero. My hands are frozen. And I'm thinking to myself, it's just too cold. I can't go the extra mile. I can't show love right now. And the Spirit of God said, you just keep shoveling. I shoveled all the way this way, shoveled all the way this way, and I stopped at their driveway. And the Spirit of God says, that's not the end. I'm not saying I was willing, folks. Don't. So kept going, kept going. Shoveled all the way in front of their house, and I stopped at the next lot line because that's their neighbor. That's not my neighbor. That's not my neighbor. That's there. I got my neighbors. But it's for God's glory. Do your neighbors know that you love them? You can say you love your neighbor, but what would they say about you? Do they know? Or they, do they think you're just irritating? Or, or you're a problem? You know, are you the one that's always yelling at the neighbor? Or are you the one that's loving? It's for God's glory. Not for you. It's for God's glory. That fruit that you're bearing, even in your neighborhood, at your workplace, it's for God's glory. Second, you, we've already talked about this. Your joy is complete. If you obey my commands and you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that your joy, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay? Sometimes we need a little joy. Sometimes you guys come in gloomy. Pastor Pedro already mentioned it when it's time for the offering. <laughs> don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Look away. Look away. Joy. Joy complete, right? Number three, and this is my favorite, your prayers are effective. Your prayers are effective. Look what Jesus said. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Why aren't your prayers always being answered? Because you're not, your prayers aren't abiding in the vine. Your prayers are for yourself instead of for the Lord. When you abide in the vine and you receive that life and you receive that wisdom and that guidance from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God knows what to pray. And he prays through us and he prays the will of the Father. And when you're praying the will of the Father, everything will work out exactly according to plan and he will answer your prayer. Now, if you're praying according to your will and your wishes... Guess what? Apart from him, you can do nothing. I've seen it. I've seen people. They're coming with selfish prayers. They're not coming with prayers that say, God, prune me. Uh, send me through trial. Send me through resistance. Send me through trouble. No, never. Never. But that's what our prayer should be, right? Whatever you have, Lord, I'm walking with you. Good or bad, live or die, I'm with you, right? Right? But I've even seen prayer requests. Lord, help me win the lottery. <laughs> that one always baffles me, and I've seen it probably a hundred times in my ministry. You're asking the man, the, the father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, creator of the universe, can speak something out of nothing, if you can win the lottery? No, that's not how it's going to work. I can already tell you that's not going to work, right? Your prayers are effective when you abide in Christ. And then finally, you are a friend of God. You can sing, I am a friend of God, but look at what John 15, verse 14 says. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. See, you know what God's all about when you abide in him. You know your master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love 
one another. Aren't you ready for that? Aren't you ready for that in your life? Ready to be an overcomer, to be a fruit bearer, to be one that abides with Christ and is separated, called. Not you don't choose him, he chooses you. And how are we going to respond to him today? By being connected, by standing and saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning and make that commitment with me? I'd say that's a commitment that all of us can make, whether we're renewing a commitment or we're starting from the beginning. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you, God, that you've made it possible for us to abide in Christ, to be connected with Christ, to be connected with the God of the universe, to receive the spirit of God as life into our spirits. And Lord, that you want to encourage us, that you want to bless us, that you want to Make us in such a way that we are bearing much fruit. Fruit that will last. Fruit that is eternal. Fruit that shows that we are disciples. Fruit that shows that we love God and we give him glory. God, forgive us for for not being fully committed. For those of us that have just kind of gone along saying we're Christians, saying we're believers, saying we love God, but there's no fruit. Examine us today, God. Examine us. Show us the areas where we can change. Allow us to be clay in your hands, that we would be transformed into your image. Though we see through a glass dimly right now, someday we'll see face to face. We will see you as you are, and you will know us by name. Lord, help us to live our lives with that goal in mind, pleasing you, knowing you, knowing you intimately, knowing everything about you, knowing expressions, sensing your still small voice, being in tune, fine-tuned to your spirit that wants to speak to us, wants to guide us, wants to bless us, wants to care for us, wants to provide every need according to your riches and glory. But Lord, you've asked that we stay in you, that we shake off, the things that distract us, that don't take us to you, but distract us from you. God, I pray that we would get rid of those phones in the morning, in the evening. Get rid of the television and say, as the psalmist says, I'm going to meditate on your word day and night. And I'm going to be like a tree that's planted by the water who brings forth fruit in due season. Because I meditate on your word day and night. Lord, there's places for social activity. There's social interaction, but everything as a connection to your spirit, to the vine, God. We commit ourselves afresh and anew today to 2018, being even closer, diving in even deeper into who you are and in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you give God praise? Give him praise. Praise his name. Say of the Lord, he is good, he is good.